everybody. Glad to see everybody again. Uh, so we're going to start our first lightning talk session for 2012. Uh, if you're not familiar with lightning talks, they're short five-minute talks on any topic with no Q&A. If you want to ask the person about something, go hunt them down after they talk. Um, they're going to be just done in the order that uh, they were submitted online, and there'll be two more of these sessions, so if you want to do a lightning talk, you can still get in on it. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand things off to uh, Kenneth Love, who's going to be actually running the session. So. Hi. So like you said, five minutes, whatever you want to talk about, hard limit on the time, and uh, nobody gets to ask questions afterwards until later. So first up, we have uh, Jason Krause with Django Hyper Admin, and then after that is me. Hello? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to be talking about a project I've been working on called Django Hyper Admin. And let's see how this works. Uh, okay. The first thing this project does is it's an API framework. Uh, it creates RESTful APIs. It's the resources, you write them like you write your admin models. It, internally, it creates a sort of hypermedia context that you know, relative to that resource, it describes what forms and links are relevant. And that powers new media types that have been progressing on the internet, like bnd.collection. And the other thing it does is it's an admin client that consumes that API. And so what it does is it takes that hypermedia context and really just templates it out using Ember.js. And I really have an eye for more clients in the future whether it be like, you know, editing a single resource or a front-end editing client. Um, this is pretty alpha, um, but this is a screenshot of like, you know, the site resource. So you go in, um, you see that it lists these items, uh, their applications, and they have links to the sub-resources. And so if I click on uh, exercise resource, um, the Ember.js client renders uh, links that can that show how it can be sorted by, filtered by, lists out the items, and at the bottom gives you a create form. And it's a little cut off. I'm sorry. Uh, if you you know either create or go and click on that item, you know then it gives you a detail view. Uh, again, with an update form, and uh, that's actually pretty much it. Um, I do have a demo site up, so you can play around. Please be gentle. It's only like a single dyno on Heroku. And that's that. Thanks. All right. I promise that mine is really, really short. It's like four slides. And after me will be uh, Scott Rubin with a talk about GitHub powered show notes. So uh, as Russell mentioned earlier, I'm doing a Kickstarter called Getting Started with Django, which is actually a restart of a series of videos I did a couple of years ago maybe even actually three years ago now. So uh, the idea behind it is that it's to teach people Django, but it's not just to get people going with Django, it's to get people that have done the Django tutorial up to the point where they feel they can actually contribute to open source projects or build an entire website all on their own or whatever it is they wanna do. Make them actually feel comfortable and competent enough to contribute to the global Django pool. Um, so yeah, basically it's aimed at people that wanna learn Django, They've done the official tutorial, they've done learn Python the hard way, things like that, and now they want to do more. Um, so how can you help? You can pledge to back it. It's actually met its goal already and passed its first stretch goal, uh, thanks to the DSF. The DSF actually put it past the stretch goal, which means all the videos are now free. They were gonna be for pay, but you guys get them for free. Uh, yeah. 
you can tell people about it. Obviously. And you can also send me ideas, resources, things like that, things you want to see included or mentioned. Uh, there's another stretch goal now that's at 10K. Uh, if it gets to 10K, I'm going to do a second series of videos over Q&A and solving difficult but common problems in a good future-proof best practices kind of way. Uh, if you want to get to it, there's the short URL, which is kind of ugly. Or you can just look on uh, Kickstarter for it. Or you can go to gettingstartedwithdjango.com. Thank you. After uh, Scott will be Tiago Garcia. Sorry if I got your name wrong. Hey, what's up? I am Scott Rubin. I'm lead developer at Broadway.com, but I also mostly, in my spare time, do a podcast called Geek Nights. Please do not listen to it. Uh, here's the website for it. Now, podcasts, we have a problem in that it's an audio show, but how can you search audio? You really can't. I mean, there's some people out there who've tried it. It doesn't work. So we need show notes, you know, not just notes like we have for most episodes, which are incredibly sparse, right? We want someone to like describe, you know, everything we've said in the podcast with time codes and all sorts of stuff like that. Something that looks more like, yes, yeah, something looks more like this. Oh, reverse scrolling, thank you. Uh, something looks more like that. So. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to write all these show notes. That's a huge pain in the butt. I want someone else to do it. Uh, so the first thing, and a lot of podcasters have done this, is use a wiki. But wikis have all sorts of trouble. You need someone to manage the wiki, to remove spam, all that kind of nonsense. So I realized, hey, Git would be the perfect solution for this, right? We could just have each show note in one file in a Git repository. And then uh, on top of that, you know, everyone who wants to modify it, because they're modifying something on my website, would send a pull request. So you can't really spam me, because I just won't accept you uh, if you try to you know, say, hey, put Viagra in your show notes. Uh, I don't think we've ever talked about Viagra. So uh, it looks more something like this. Oh, come on. Right reverse scrolling again. Show notes, there it is, FRC show notes, right? So we organize them sort of, you know, the readme tells you what file to, uh, to edit. And so we'll go here, let's see, podcast Monday, there it is, cyberization, right, here's the show note. Uh, I used HTML, you could use Markdown or whatever if you wanted, right? So if you want to modify the show notes for that episode, you just send in uh, a pull request, and that's all there is to it. Uh, so how does this actually work? It is the stupidest code in the universe. Uh, just uh, github.com, am I running out of time yet? Three, two, three, six, two, two, six. <laughs> there we go. Stupidest code in the world. It's really just this first function, right? We, j we create, we had to actually change it because the GitHub 2 Python module didn't work when GitHub deprecated their old API. So now it's just a stupid uh, URL of 2 call. It just generates the URL with the right user repo and the file path, uh, gets the contents, D6, uh, base64 deencodes them and puts them in the context as an example view. Uh, it actually includes caching, because who wants to hit the GitHub API every time the page loads? Nobody. Uh, and it's actually, if you think about it, right, this little stupid piece of code is actually kind of awesome. And I'm pretty proud of it. All right, thanks. Next up is Tiago Garcia, and after that is, uh, is yeah, you again. Okay, uh, do you want me to do uh, the, sure. the two of them, or do one, then the nah, you can go ahead and do both of them real quick. Both, okay. Do you want me to do that? Just watch your can first one. Can you start one. with another one first? Sure. Okay, there's no. Which one's your other one? The, the second one. one, yes. Hello. Okay, so I will talk about the, this project. It's Model Mummy. It's a factory to create random data for your tests. And it's easy, really easy to, to use. I use every day on all my tests. It's just, you said, Mummy, make me one. Tell the, where your model is. And okay, it generates random data. If you have a name, uh, short field, it's created short field. If it has a max length, it's created with the max length. If you uh, have an email, it's a valid email, okay? 
or you can just prepare one and do not save. So you can play a little bit and then save to the database. Or you can also define custom attributes. So make a person and get the person name, or you can prepare one. It's, it's just like this. One save, but do another one doesn't. And this is really cool. This was implemented uh, not a long time ago. You can create a lot of models in your tests on one line just. You like doing this. You have a dog, and this dog have an owner, which is a person. So you have mommy, make me a dog, and the owner name is or can, okay? And, and they create everything. You create the dog and create the owner, and the name of the owner will be Clark Kent. So you can test everything and anything you want. Okay, but what if I don't like random data? Do you have to use another lib? No. Nope. It have what you call recipes. Recipes are a way to create this, the same thing, but with um, the full, the full things. So you can create a rest for example, a reuser, and you have the first name, the last name, and you can also use lazy attributes like the last login with the time now. Okay, you, it's really, you, really simple to use it. You just tell to prepare a recipe, and you get the name of the recipe, like user here, and you say user there, or you can make the recipe. And you can pass other attributes or override the attributes you have. So that is it. It's really useful when you're testing your general application. The, co the code is in this GitHub. My friend GitHub from, from Brazil, he made it. Um, okay, if I want to submit some patches and any questions, we will be on the conference, okay? So I, I have another Latin talk. <laughs> okay, so it's also about tests. The, what the, the best way to get full screen? Here. Here. Okay, so this is about tests too, but it's more an experimental thing we did. After work, we have this crazy idea of the Django memory query set. And what we want is speed up fixture loading. We have a project, we use a lot of fixture, and they are fucking big fixtures, and they take a lot of time to, to run the tests. So when the speed of the fixture makes the test faster and learns something about the, how model works on, on Django. So it's pure Python, no dependence, no driver, no SQL, just Python objects. Oh, what exactly does? You, instead of use the, the test case, you can use the memory test case. And you, or you can patch your models. Well, what it does it, instead of loading your fixture, to a memory database, the SQLite, for example, yes, yes, it's SQLite. It loads to a um, like a big dictionary on the memory, and you can access direct this, this dictionary and uh, and uh, the objects from there. So it's really really fast because you don't use mod, you don't use databases. It's just memory and the objects, and uh, when you um, inherit from memory test case instead of the, the test case, it's, what it does it, it changes, it patches the, the save function and the manager function of the classes, of the models. So it saves to this dictionary, this global dictionary you can go to, and uh, the manager, instead of going to the database, it's go to the dictionary. So it's pretty, pretty simple. So where are you now? We are not stable to release. We have only 60% of the Kairosite API implemented because when you're using this on memory, you have to implement it, well, every query set to, to do the queries and uh, to the memory instead of the database. And we have a little issues with forms. And that is it, we can have the search the there. And Felipe was the guy who, who made this with me. It's uh, his GitHub and my GitHub is, is down. If you can help us to, to build this or have any questions, who requests anything? That's it. Thank you very much. And 
Actually, after that, we've got Nikolai Bear. Yep. All right, you're just using the browser, right? Yeah. Here comes this URL. Skip the presentation that I had there. Um, hope we'll log in here. So, um, hi, my name is Nikolai. I work for uh, Lightcube. Uh, we uh, we have a CMS e-commerce platform, it's like uh, sort of both CMS and kind of like a Magento parody e-commerce platform. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you guys about is a uh, Docket. Is a cool. Uh, oops, get that out of the way. Is a kind of a cool project that we've been working on. Actually, it was created by. Uh, Jason Krause, who did the hyper admin thing. Um, and uh, what it is, is application level document storage. Uh, so, uh, whereas right now we have models in the ORM, this is like an object based API that uh, stores documents. Um, and then on top of that, uh, built on top of this docket CMS, also open source project, um, that allows you to uh, generate on the fly class based views and URL routing uh, to access those documents. Um, all of this boils down to something akin to uh, content construction kit like Drupal. Um, uh, basically lets you brew up models on the fly, reference stuff in the existing admin. Um, and right now we're kind of incubating inside WebCube as kind of an escape hatch for all the times where we want to build a new model, build new stuff, let people interact with it like a Django model, but not have to roll out new code and push it to a site. Um, so just gonna kind of quickly show here, uh, doc kit on the left here, we uh, can create a collection. That's akin to a model. Um, so I created one here called DjangoCon demo uh, in case this doesn't work. Um, and I do something wrong, a live demo here. So create a collection type, you want it to be a document. And uh, here, key is gonna be the demo, so let's go with demo, demo one. Um, put it, group them inside applications, uh, uh, just like we do in Django. Um, and then, let me just quickly set the limits per page. This is relatively alpha at this point. Um, and then we can add, basically, arbitrary fields to the document. Um, this is basically constructing our model. Um, the only cool thing is that since it's actually a document, like a JSON object, you can add multiple levels, and you can add rich schemas within different layers. So you could actually build like a list of complex items, and inside that you could have like a, an object that has like an image and an alt tag and some other information. So I'll keep it simple here. Uh, so add a text field. Um, let's just call this description. So, and then I'll add another, um, I'll add a slug field. I'm gonna call that, obviously, slug. Um, and ultimately, you have to save and continue your, uh, your document. So I've now created this collection um, through some trickery. It shows up down here, demo one. Um, and so I could actually add a demo one object down here. Um, right there, I could add different objects. Apparently, I've already built that. Um, so apparently there's two of them. So there's a demo one object. Uh, and so the next step is that you create an index on it. So it's a document. Uh, one of the problems with documents uh, is not easy to index them and pull them up like SQL models and relational stuff. Uh, so I'll just kind of jump to this existing one I have here. So I created a document, and in this case I had another uh, collection I created called uh, DJ Demo. I select the collection I want to index, and at the bottom I say exclude. You could be like published equals true, and then finally you could say the match slug is exact. Um, so with that, you can basically, it starts to proactively index the object uh, every time it's saved. Um, so the next step is to go into uh, docket CMS, which is uh, and create a viewpoint. Um, so in this case, uh, I'll just use one I built here already. Um, so we'll create, you can use it. Basically, right now, these basic viewpoints piggyback on, on the generic views in Django. So in this case, I create a viewpoint that's a detail view. I pass in the slug field, say, hey, access the slug field on my collection, uh, mount it on the URL DJ demos, um, mix-ins allow you to add a lot of really cool fiction functionality potentially for things, and then uh, here's the index I want to run off of, and then here's my template uh, source, and here you can see I just have a little template, you can do HTML or by template name, and so the end result of this is that we have a, uh, let me quickly see what this, end result is we have a, effectively a model that we brewed in, did I do test, is that that? Yeah, so there's the test. Um, so you can see it, once it gets to the template at that point, it's just like using a regular old Django model. Um, so what is this in to totality is a 
brewable Django models on the fly um, at the base layer, and on top of that, really, what is it, a deeper level is you have rich objects that you can uh, treat and have nice object API and brew into, uh, into sites, so um, kind of a really exciting project. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in it, uh, talk to us. Also, uh, we do have uh, WebKey demo sites available, so if you want to get one, it's uh, come see us, or it's webkeycms.com slash DangoCon. And now we have Darren Swanson. Uh, so you're a manager. And next up will be Russell, if he's around. Uh, okay, yeah. go without the notes. All right, so um, this isn't a technical talk, as you can tell from the, uh, the title, but uh, I think it's something very important to your technical success. Uh, you know, you work at a company for a little while, you've been doing great at engineering, and uh, you suddenly start thinking, what's this management thing? How do we work? Uh, you know, is that something I want to do? And so, you know, I'd kind of like to take you through how we've been doing it at, at uh, where I work, at New Relic, and uh, what we've considered, and some of our best practices. So uh, when you become a manager, your product moves from, being, from the software to being the people. But you still want to build a lasting and scalable product. And this also becomes your number one job. You're no longer um, writing code as your, as your key artifact or deliverable, but you're actually becoming a people engineer. You refactor people just like you would, used to be refactoring code. And I'd propose that this is, can be almost just as challenging. So how do you care about people? You know, this is something that's important as a manager, and I'd, you know, I'd say number one slide, this is one of the number one ideas. Um, I'd boil it down, make it easy to be happy while you're shipping your code, while you're shipping your new features. Are the engineers on your team where they need to be to continue to be enthused about what you're building? Do you know where they're going and how they need to get there in their career and their technical skills? Uh, um, detect, prevent, and reduce friction. You know, how can you be ahead of the thing? Can you plan to find things that are going to happen? Just like if you're project planning, can you plan people's careers and also, you know, where they're going? Don't ever gloss over trouble. If you wait to deal with something, you're only going to cause more issues in the future. And always be honest. Um, part of being honest is being available for communication. So if you care about your people, you work it out in the open areas. You're not spending all your time reading email or in meetings. Wander around in the morning. How are people doing? Pick up on nuances that maybe they're not as happy as they could be. Are, is your team excited to be there on Monday? Are they spending time with family and friends? Are they taking vacations? Are they contributing to open source and building communities? So after that, you know, you're, you're working to foster the team. You need to make sure you're rewarding the team goal, team, teamwork. You want to look at team goals, not individual goals. If you, try to, if you set up for people to compete at an individual level, um, it won't, you won't have success in a team. People will do that naturally. And look for places where people um, state things like, it's not my problem. You want to refactor that very quick, quickly. Publicly recognize wins, lead by exa examples, and look for opportunities to help. All of this while being invisible. If a manager is doing a good job, she will be invisible. Influence should be felt, not heard. Um, multiply your team's awesomeness. Take no credit. Your engineers are the stars of the organization, not you. So experiment. You should be able to measure your success. Try things continuously, measure, analyze the results, rinse and repeat. Discard un unsuccessful attempts. People will trust you with their ideas if they know you'll keep the good ones and discard the bad ones. They also need to see that there's room for creativity. So you have to allow people to fail. You're working towards building a frictionless process and that will enable your team for more and, and even greater successes in the future. So who's your team, though? Who is your primary team when you're a manager? I would propose that it's actually the other managers within your organization or other people that are doing management. You can't do this alone, and you really don't know what you're doing. Um, you need feedback. You need to be talking about what you're doing, what you're proposing, what your experiments are, and you need it to be honest feedback. Um, work with others who are doing the exact same things that you are. Find a mentor. 
Um, I would even go as far as find someone who's like a professor, someone who's been there, done that, and wants to teach you. Um, and you can also save yourself a bunch of mistakes. You can learn from other people's examples and mistakes. If it's not in your own company, if you're a small shop, look outside your company. There's lots of people who love talking about this. And there's also lots of resources you can use as a conversation starter with other people with similar interests. That's it. <laughs>